Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Fegan and I am a freelance book editor. I know on booktube and just in like the book community in general there are a lot of people who are potentially interested in editing uh, and so in this video I'm going to talk about my life as an editor, some questions, how I got started, and all of that. This video will be split up into three parts if you're only interested in certain sections. So first I'm going to talk about my entire history with editing and how I got to this point. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what my life and my work looks like, like what I actually do, and then I'm going to talk about my tips and my advice and all that stuff um, for aspiring editors. Timestamps to those sections will be in the description below so you're free to skip around, um, but without further ado, let's get started. Like many people, I have been a book lover pretty much my entire life. I mean, from as long as I can remember, I was the kid who was reading at recess and all that nerdy shit. So to start at the very beginning, we have a love of books. And then starting in like the fourth, fifth grade, I thought maybe I'd like to be a writer. I started like writing all these novels. And by that, I mean like writing the paragraph description for what the book would be about, but not writing any of the books. So like reader and writer were kind of my main identities for I think like really like the formative parts of my childhood. Then in the seventh grade, I got a Tumblr. Tumblr is actually how I even have a following on YouTube at all because people knew me on Tumblr and then followed me on YouTube and now we're here. So thanks to the people who have been there from the beginning. But I say this because when I started writing poetry in the eighth grade, I feel like I kind of got this sort of identity on Tumblr as like that young poet writer girl. This all leads me to in the ninth grade, the very first thing I edited, I should not have had this authority at all, but a follower on Tumblr asked me to edit her college application essay, which I did. From there, high school was kind of this menagerie of small editing things. I helped a lot of friends with their essays for high school, and when we got to like the college application process, I helped a lot of friends with um, college application essays. And I also went to this writing camp at the Duke Young Writers Camp, um, which was very poetry focused, for me at least, and so there was a lot of helping my poet friends with poetry. At that camp especially, there was a lot of back and forth. I don't want to make it seem like I was just like the one competent friend who knew how to edit, but like rather there was a lot of the collaborative process going on and I got to be a part of that. Another thing I forgot to mention is that I was one of those really annoying grammar kids when I was in like elementary school. Like I'd call you out for using the wrong who or whom. And even though we were all like nine years old, if someone wrote the wrong there, I would call them out on it. You know, like you do when you're nine and annoying. So <laughs> I do think part of the reason people came to me um, at first was not just like this love of books, but also this interest in grammar. I also worked on the lit mag in high school, but that was kind of a small thing. And that's, those are the first few years. And during this time, like, my life plan is all over the place. I'm thinking maybe I want to be a math professor because for those who don't know, I feel like my entire life has been like math and kind of chemistry and then books. These are the two things I've always been interested in. So I was thinking math professor, mathematician, I was thinking poet or writer, and then I was thinking editor. It was in the fold, but it was never like the one main dream I had. Then I got to college and there were a lot more opportunities for me to do like real editing, if you will. Um, I copy edited for a bunch of publications for a newspaper on campus um, and for like this art magazine that I ended up working for and for a what it called academic journal. So copy editing, I got to like hone my grammar skills and all like the, the small rules that they don't actually really teach you anywhere that you kind of just have to, have to pick up on in life. Um, all of those kind of got refined in those experiences. And then the summer between my sophomore and junior year, I had an internship at Penguin Random House. This uh, and internships in general, I will talk more about later in the third section, but this was basically a dream come true. I'm from Long Island, so working in New York City was something that I was looking to do that summer anyways. I applied to a ton of places and I ended up working at Delacorte Press, which is a female only, like the staff was all, f all female staff, um, young adult and middle grade imprint. Most of my job that summer was um, reading the manuscripts that we got in and deciding whether or not they should take them. Obviously more eyes were on them than just one intern, but I feel like I was kind of often the first eyes that got to see them. And then there were a few books that were already um, in the works that they had that I got to like be another pair of eyes on and suggest things, which was really awesome. And then for the rest of college, I kind of just continued doing a lot of the small stuff that I used to do. Um, I helped people with college application essays or grad school application essays and a few college friends with their essays. Caveat here, I just really want to quickly add, I never wrote an essay for anyone in case anyone's worried about this. This was all, someone would come to me with their thing and I would like help line edit. There was no 
pay me to write your essay type stuff going on. None of that. And the final college experience I had was that art magazine that I mentioned. Um, I got to be a section editor for and then a managing editor. So I was at, by the time I graduated, like the head of the narrative section for that, which meant I got to work with authors one-on-one -on -one and help them get their ideas to the place that they were publishable, which went through like the, the idea process to the line editing and all of that. I mention all of this to say that my history is rife not just with reading and writing, but also with editing. I think to be at the place where I am now, and again, I'll talk a lot about this more in like my advice and tips, um, but I think that there's always been a love of editing within me. It wasn't just that I've really loved reading for my whole life. From a young age, I was interested in the language aspect and in the like correction process. I actually think because I love math, it's why I love copy editing because like certain things about language are very um, subjective, but like where a comma goes, especially just in like fiction or nonfiction, that's kind of a mathematical process. So that's my history with editing and oh, how we got to where I am right now. Last April, I think, um, when it was my, my senior year of college uh, and everything was happening, I got a message from someone on LinkedIn who works at the site that I currently work for. I don't actually work for the site. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name, so I'm just gonna not, but if you Google me, I come up. Um, but there's like a marketplace of editors and so like if you have a manuscript you can sign up and like search the manuscript for like someone who does poetry or someone who does coming of age i do both of those um and like my name will come up and you send me a request um and so this person reached out to me who works for the site and was like we think you would be good for our site and so then i was able to sign up and i've been working since last may so that's how i got to where i am now um and now to talk about what do I do? What do I work on? What are the jobs that I do? What does it look like? Yada yada yada. In terms of the types of books I work on, um, my expertise is really in poetry and in novels. So you can put the genres that you're most comfortable with or that you have like expertise in. And so I have, I think like coming of age, new adult, YA, things like that. And again, people send requests to me and then I talk with them and we get to figure out if I'm the right editor for them, um, if we're all on the same page about like pricing and timeline and what the services are asking for are and all of that good stuff. And in terms of services, um, here are some industry buzzwords. Um, there are, I think, four main things that I offer, an editorial assessment, a developmental edit, a copy edit, and a proofread. An editorial assessment is basically when you read the manuscript and you provide a like three to 10 page, depending on how long the project is, what the genre is, um, assessment on the pros and cons, what can be worked on, um, yeah, where the problem areas are, and all of that. I personally love an editorial assessment from a very personal level, like the first couple weeks of the work are just getting to read and take notes, which is what I do when I read a book anyways. I don't always take notes, but like, it's just careful reading and paying attention really closely to the plot, which I find fun. And again, this is often the first step in the process because this can lead to like very major changes. Like, I think you're doing a really good thing here, but I think this whole character does a disservice to your novel. Obviously that's gonna lead to a lot of changes. You wouldn't wanna get a copy edit done before that because if you do a copy edit and then an editorial assessment, uh, and then you take out a character, you're gonna need another copy edit because the entire copy's changed, you know? So I'll do these in like chronological order, what, you know, the step you would do if you're like writing a novel and wanted to get these done. The next would usually be a developmental edit. This is, I think, what most people just think of as an edit. This is like a thorough line edit of the whole thing that takes the big picture and the small picture all into account. When I'm doing a developmental edit, it's obviously to develop the novel. It's noticing things from the word choice level to the sentence level to the paragraph level to the chapter level, uh, pretty much all across the board, like what can be changed here. This can and usually does lead to a lot of big changes. It's just kind of in a different form than in an editorial assessment because you're actually working directly with the text. You're pointing out, oh, this line should be tweaked or I didn't understand this scene or things like that. So it's very involved and this is the most time consuming, expensive and rigorous. I also quickly wanna add, I know I'm talking about all these in the context of novels, but all these can obviously happen with poetry that just take slightly different forms you know a poetry editorial assessment might not be 10 pages because you can't really say unless it's fictional poetry like change this character around but there are obviously ways to like help develop poetry on a very thorough level i'm just 
talking about novels because it's easier to streamline these. Then a copy edit, and this is like the grammar, tone, fact checking, uh, punctuation, spelling edit. When you do a copy edit, you're probably not changing big plot things. You're noticing, you know, where a sentence needs to be restructured because it's grammatically funky, or where commas are misplaced, or where, oh, you mentioned it was Thursday a week ago, but now it's Saturday now, so it wasn't a week, it wasn't exactly a week, things like this. This is just really fine-tuning a manuscript to make sure that it reads well, it is accurate to itself and to the world, um, and that the grammar is all set and good. And a poetry copy edit, um, for instance, is obviously grammar heavy, but because poetry doesn't have to stick to like grammatical conventions, what I usually do when I'm doing a copy edit um, for poetry is just making sure the author is consistent within it's like their own work. If they usually have all caps at the beginning of a line, there's one poem where like a few lines deviate, I'll usually change this and also point it out because not every single poem that a poet writes has to be in the same style, but just saying, hey, you usually do this when you deviate, just know that like this looks really intentional stuff like that. And then a proofread is usually the finalize. It is making sure everything is neat. A proofread, uh, for my purposes, is sometimes kind of hard to price because sometimes I'll proofread something and it's seen like eight different sets of eyes and it's so clean and I just have a comma to like catch every few pages. But sometimes uh, someone skipped maybe a copy edit and so a proofread's a little bit more involved, but it's just making sure that there are no errors in the text and that it's all ready to go. In terms of things like timeline and pricing, you, you set up a timeline with the author in the beginning and to me it totally just depends on the word count. You know, if I'm doing an editorial assessment for a really long novel, I'm gonna want enough time to make sure I read and I'm really careful with it. I've tried to double book myself in the past and have discovered that for me that doesn't work. It's nice and it's appealing because it's more money, but I like being able to really focus on one project at a time. And on the micro level on a day-to-day, -day, um, say I have like two weeks to work on a project, I don't have to check in every single day and say I'm starting work now, I'm leaving work now, like you'd have to check in with like at an actual job. I get to wake up and do my work and then the work's done. Granted, for someone like me who is a workaholic, this can sometimes be tricky because I'll wake up and just my brain will wanna work all day because there's no such thing as done until the project's done. But because I have all day and like this really long project, I think like, well, let, let me just do as much as I can today and then I drive myself crazy. I don't recommend this. <laughs> so it is a lot of self-regulation. Like today I only have to edit 15 pages because I know I've spaced it out. And I know if I do 15 pages every single day, I'll be done when I have to be done and that'll be good. And that leads me to my final section, which is advice, tips, things you should know if you want to go into editing. Obviously, I don't actually have experience, except for when I worked at Random House, with traditional publishing, so most of my tips um, are going to be focused on like a freelancer's lifestyle. Some of them obviously overlap with traditional publishing, but I can only speak to my experience. Um, so some of these things don't apply to um, traditional publishing, some of them do, just want to put that out there. The number one thing I want to recommend, and it's going to sound harsh and that's why I want to say it from the jump, is that you should love editing if you go into editing. It is not enough to love books, it is not enough to love reading, and it is not enough to love writing. These things are obviously all interconnected. I think being a good reader makes you a better writer. I think being a good reader has made me a better editor, and so they're all combined but I don't think I would be a good editor and I don't think I would love being an editor if I didn't love editing. A lot of it is very different from loving books. Again, a lot of the copy editing and proofreading stuff, that's having a really, really fine eye to detail that is completely different from just like picking up a book for pleasure. And another reason why I think you have to really love editing is for me personally, editing kind of sometimes saps my desire to read on my own time. I mean, I want to be reading, but when I spend like four hours working on a book, what my brain and my soul needs next is contrast. So the last thing I'm gonna want to do is pick up another book because I've just spent so long looking at words all day that I'll do something like watch an episode of Survivor or something. And I do things that I like. It's not like I'm deciding to do boring things after I work, but like it's very rare that after I'm done working, I want to be reading. So if reading is your number one thing, I, I kind of would say be wary of wanting to go into editing because it's not just a life of reading what you want to read all day long. And obviously I like the projects that I work on. I choose the ones that I work on because I enjoy them and want to see them be better, but it, it's, it's, it's not the same process as reading something you just pick up for fun. And so in hand with that, how do you develop a love for editing? 
I think you just kind of start editing. There are a lot of opportunities in high school and in college um, to get started where you don't really need a ton of experience. I know anyone could have joined my lit mag in high school. Anyone can join the newspaper. In college, some of, the things, some of these things are more um, competitive, but even then, if you have like five people applying to like three positions on a lit mag in college, that's very different from like a uh, 150 people applying to like two positions at a publishing house over the summer. So really the only way you're to see if you like this is to do some of it in a very um, low risk environment like a club. And then the topic of the summer internship. Um, the only reason I'm able to do the stuff that I do now I think is because I technically worked with a professional company. I cannot state how uh, like how grateful I am for having that because I don't think I'd be able to do this now if I didn't have have that summer. And here are my tips for that. Apply everywhere you can. I applied to I think 31 internships that summer and I heard back from two. I heard back from Random House and then um, like I think a week or two later I heard back from another place that I obviously had to turn down because I'd already gotten the other one but I don't even think I heard a peep from the other 29. Like I don't even know if I got rejections. It was just radio silence. So I consider myself really really lucky that I got that one at all, that I got those two at all. Um, and it's I don't think it's enough to just apply to like the big five. Like if if you want to go into publishing, you probably know some of the big names like Scholastic, Random House, Macmillan, Simon & Schuster, and all of them. But really broaden your fields. There are a lot of smaller agencies and, and liter um, yeah, literary agencies that need like a couple people every summer and if fewer people are applying to them your chances are greater and you'll get that experience that you want. A piece of advice for freelancers in particular, you gotta be good at managing time. I am not. <laughs> I am a workaholic Capricorn from New York, which means um, that I want to be working all the time. Like I wake up and I think how much work can I get done today? I am also the most scatterbrained person possible. So like 30 minutes of work will take me about an hour because I do a page and I think of something that I want to Google and I have no self-discipline at all. Today, actually the day I'm filming this, I'm trying to rectify that because I've realized that I've been like waking up at like 9 a.m. looking at a screen until I go to bed at one because it'll take me so long to do my stupid work. My work isn't stupid, I'm just so frustrated with myself. Um, it'll take me so long to do my work uh, and, and during that work I've been checking Twitter like a thousand and eighty times in the day and it's just, you need to have self-discipline, especially if you're gonna do anything freelance. My final piece of advice, and I know this is sort of antithetical to the first thing I said, is keep reading. I think I'm a good editor because I love to read and have read a lot and I'm a good reader. You know, if someone will send me a request and say, this book was inspired by Cat's Cradle by Vonnegut, I can say, I've read Cat's Cradle by Vonnegut, I know what you're getting at, and I think I can be the editor for you. And even reading things that are outside of your comfort zone, like a lot of people writing poetry now are inspired by things like Milk and Honey, which might not be my favorite type of poetry, but because I've read some of her stuff, I can look to what these people are doing and say, I know what you're trying to do, I know the genre you're working in, and even if it's not something I would have picked up on my own, I can help you with this from an editor's perspective. There is almost a degree of like, humbling that has to go on, where like, not every project you work on is gonna be something you would have picked up, but you're not reading it as a reader. You're reading it and working on it as an editor. I think that is one of the misconceptions that led me to say that harsh reality or whatever, that like, if you're working with something you love, you're always gonna love it. It's still work. I enjoy the stuff that I do, but it's still work. I still wake up and I'm like, I go to work. Like, like all people do, you know? So I think going into that with that mindset is really healthy, knowing that like, yeah, it's not always going to be peaches and roses and I get to read a book today for my job. It's hard work. But ultimately, I feel very grateful to have this job right now, especially like, Having a job where I don't have to go into an office this year is really, really a blessing. Um, I, I feel like at some point in my life I'm gonna want to like have coworkers and have an office to go into because I kind of like that environment. I like waking up, having somewhere to be, and then getting to come home. But for these few years at least, like this is th the greatest gift I could have gotten and I really, I feel very lucky. So that's my probably like 30 minute long video about freelance editing, what I do, how I got here, my tips. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the uh, comments below. I'm happy to make another video about this, a Q and A if anyone's interested or if like someone asks a question that I'm like, wow, I have 10 minutes I can talk about this. 
I will. Also, if you've watched this long, A, thank you for watching this whole thing. B, if you're a regular viewer and wondering why, man, this girl rarely puts out book videos on her, her book YouTube channel, it's because I've read like four books this year and I love reading, but my reading is just slow. So thank you for bearing with me as a content creator. I love you guys. The world is good. But that is all I have for you today. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. So that's how we- oh my god. Wow.